the end of the presentation. This week's presentation from Nathan Johanny. Nathan Johanny is a commercial agriculture educator for University of Illinois Extension in Madison, Monroe, and St. Clair counties. He develops and delivers research-based programs that include collaborations with extension educators and campus-based specialists that focus on agronomic and horticulture crop production. This includes cover crops, pest management, soil and nutrient management, no-till, and pumpkins. Nathan was previously a local foods and small farms educator and still continues to this day to provide support for our team's efforts with his programming and research. And as the Republic Times newspaper of Southern Illinois stated in the fall of 2020, he is Monroe County's pumpkin ban. So who better to provide today's talk on pumpkin production than Monroe County's pumpkin ban? Welcome, Nathan. Thank you very much. And I suppose that's what I get for not giving you a formal bio, right? <laughs> the discretion of the uh, discretion of the uh, moderator. But no, As thank always. you very much, and uh, and I'm happy to happy to be here and share some information about pumpkin. So today we're going to be you know vining through pumpkin production as our uh, as our title says. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So starting off with some pumpkin facts. So remember that, especially now, um, as we get into in the last few years behind Christmas, Halloween is the holiday that Americans spend the most on. So these fall cucurbits, uh, pumpkins, gourds, and squash are becoming you know, extremely prevalent in our uh, in, in the marketplace and the demand for them has really been increasing over especially the last, I would say 10 or even five years. There's all kinds of opportunities. You pick farmers markets, um, school tours, agritourism, wholesale. And you know, the main marketing, although it keeps creeping up a little bit earlier is from early September through October 31st. And I kind of put that as a, as kind of a hard deadline and all in a way, because uh, if you haven't been in this game, you do know that as October 31st approaches, the, the marketability for pumpkins in general tends to decrease. There are some niches where you can maybe market them, but even for those edible purposes, just like a general marketing, really after Halloween, things just uh, really dry up. And actually I have found the peak in the last few years has been probably the last, the last week of September, first week of October is probably the peak with then, you know, on either side of that kind of uh, kind of a buildup and, and kind of decrease of, of market. So, but certainly just uh, an increasing market and a lot different than it looks now than what it did years ago. So some production considerations. So we're gonna address some of these things in uh, among a few others. So site selection, maintain fertility, varieties, and pest management. Those are some production things with all crops, but just especially this that are very important. So looking at a site, um, pumpkins do not tolerate waterlogged soil. So well-drained soils are the best. We don't all have those, but if uh, no matter what, uh, no matter the type, trying to have a situation where you can um, where you can have uh, fields that are not prone to holding water. Uh, you know, the, if you have low spots in the fields, then certainly try to um, you know, avoid any of those at all costs. Uh, rotate away from cucur cucurbit crops for at least three years is preferred. Again, in some cases, that's not always an option, but if you're starting off, especially with a UPIC operation where you have you know, proximity issues with your farm market and your try to set yourself up that you can rotate some different areas nearby your farm. Uh, I've worked with growers that haven't had that opportunity. And as you get, um, say, even three, five, 10 years in, um, they encounter a lot of pest buildup issues from not having that crop rotation diversity. So try to do that. Uh, wherever you can. And longer is certainly better, but uh, three years is, is a happy baseline. Um, think about uh, access for the field for crop maintenance, harvesting and marketing. So some of the agritourism opportunities, certainly that's where we pick a certain field because it has good visibility. It has access to a farm stand if we have people coming on the farm. 
Another consideration, which isn't, I think, uh, crucial, but some people may want to irrigate pumpkins. I will say overall, the majority of pumpkins you know, that we grow in the, in the region are not irrigated. But if you want to, then you know, keep in mind that proximity to water and irrigation. Uh, soil fertility. So I, with everything, start with a soil test. You really need to make sure we have a, a soil test results so we, we know where we're at. Um, so these, in my mind, are some ideal uh, nutrient ranges uh, for, uh, for pumpkins. Uh, pH in the really between six to seven is, is ideal. Um, phosphorus between, say, 45 to 75 pounds. Potassium, um, you know, somewhere between 260 to 400. Um, and then calcium, magnesium, I, I have some ranges here. Realistically, those are some baselines. Occasionally we will see levels, especially for calcium, magnesium, a lot higher than that. And that is certainly fine. Um, if, and then sulfur is something I mentioned because we are starting to see some, um, some issues with sulfur. So I encourage any farm to consider, um, consider taking a sulfur test and just knowing kind of where you're at. The biggest thing, if I had to choose, certainly your pH, phosphorus, and potassium are the main things to be concerned about, especially your pH. So soil fertility, uh, what would you do with the regards to annual maintenance fertilizer, especially as far as nitrogen, where we don't do a lot of, of nitrogen testing as far as a long range amounts of nitrogen, but we do have some parameters. Uh, we range from 60 to 120 pounds per acre of, of actual nitrogen. Um, lower amounts would be in areas where you have very high organic matter soils, especially with conventional tillage um, in the central and northern parts of Illinois and similar areas. <clears throat> also, we would use higher amounts on some of our lighter color soils, say we have in southern Illinois, maybe they're in closer to two or a little less than 2% organic matter, um, our, what I say our forest soils, not our, our dark prairie soils. And then also we tend to uh, elevate some of our nitrogen rates just to, to the higher end of that range. Um, whenever we're using say no-till and using a lot of cereal grain cover crops, just trying to, especially early in the season, uh, account for some of, the, um, uh, some of the nutrients that are maybe temporarily tied up in some of those cereal grain cover crops. Uh, I always encourage people with nitrogen, especially to uh, split your applications, do some of it uh, pre-emergence or first of the season, and then follow up with some side dress. Some will, uh, will do all up front. However, I think um, it's a good way to balance your fertility and watch your crop and be able to kind of maybe tweak that side dress application up or down uh, and give you some flexibility. Do not over fertilize with nitrogen. More is not necessarily better. Pumpkins are unique in that uh, compared with some crops is because you can heavily promote vine growth and get uh, limited fruit set uh, whenever you have um, too much nitrogen. So if you get much above that 120 pounds per acre, um, you tend to, uh, you can get issues with, especially with the right growing conditions, adequate moisture, you can get just really lush vines and the plant puts its energy in that versus trying to put the energy into um, uh, setting fruit and, and, and putting on flowers. So, uh, so some general guidelines um, for general maintenance fertilizer, and these do vary somewhat, of course, by soil test, but a general removal, I would say on average around 50 pounds of phosphorus and 125 pounds of potassium uh, would be uh, approximate values. Pumpkins are very heavy potassium feeders. So there are some great resources. I'll uh, talk about these more at the end with some others, but one resource that I would like to share right now and kind of highlight is the Kentucky Vegetable Production Guide, uh, ID 36. And it's, you can easily search that title and find a PDF online. Um, they have really good for all vegetable crops uh, tables that give you uh, your soil test values, which you can see. I have circled there, and then that directly references uh, a fertility range that you need to make uh, for those soil test values to basically balance and make uh, prescriptions as to, uh, to how much fertility to apply for phosphorus and potassium based on your soil test. It's a great resource uh, for all crops, and I certainly for this especially, this 
nutrient content, I, I refer to it quite heavily. So now moving on to planning methods. There's some different concepts you can apply. So things like, uh, are you gonna have conventional till versus no till? Are you gonna use cover crops versus bare soil? Uh, or direct seed versus transplant, hand plant versus mechanical, or even utilizing plastic mulches and any other of these combinations above. Really all of these options are in play. I've known even larger growers. You see, I have a picture of uh, just a hoe that you'll go through the field, um, even in, conventional or uh, no-till systems. And, you know, we, we plant pumpkins fairly light as far as spacing compared to things like say corn or soybeans or many other crops which are planting a lot higher density. So it's not out of question, even a, you know, a few acres that you couldn't walk through kind of systematically and even plant seeds uh, or even set some transplants by hand. So looking at tillage systems, um, conventional tillage is very common, so it relies on multiple cultivations and a little less reliant on herbicides for weed control, but we do have the concept that our tillage is bringing up new weed flushes. Um, and with that uh, intensive tillage, that field access can be harder after it rains. This is um, somewhat important for crop maintenance in a way as far as getting out in the field to, say, make uh, fungicide sprays, but it's probably most important where you're talking about harvest, uh, even more so whenever you have um, you pick operations uh, and you're trying to get out in the field, but really any kind of harvest because you are out in the field a lot with any of our specialty crops, pumpkins included for different harvest activities. And inevitably, you know, markets happen um, whether or not the field is muddy. So uh, having a clean tilled field does make that more challenging. I've even heard of a few uh, UPIC operations that have been conventional till that have made comments that they've had to close even on a, a prime weekday because the field was just too muddy to get people out in it. Uh, now you compare that with no till. So a stale seed bed approach where you're not breaking up that soil later in the season, you can have fewer flushes of weeds. Um, you're, you are more reliant on herbicides, but also your cover crops to control your weeds, and you have less erosion potential and uh, better soil health and also better, uh, better field access um, because you, have, you haven't broken up the natural structure of the soil with that tillage, so it tends to be um, uh, more solid to support, say, foot traffic, and then that cover crop on top of there also adds some extra protection as well to help support uh, travel through the field on foot or with equipment. So I mentioned, I show this photo and mention this because this is an illustration I'd found and actually more of a larger production field from a few years ago, but a little bit of tillage can sometimes go a long ways for our weed management. As you look at this picture on the left, you see an area and that green is predominantly water hemp, which is a common um, kind of pigweed species weed we have, and especially in the southern part of the state and many areas. Um, the only difference in this field is on the right side, we had uh, actually not necessarily a cover crop, but it was uh, a winter annual grass. In this case, it was called little barley that acted somewhat like a cover crop um, that had not been tilled uh, compared with the, um, the left side of the screen where the farmer had run through with a disc on the headlands and the outside of the field, open it up, it rained, they couldn't get back in the field. And this is what they're left with. Certainly shows you a dramatic way of how tillage and cultivation, you could apply it to that, can bring up new weed flushes, whereas a no-till environment, you can see the kind of pressure you're up against in those two situations. So benefits of, of cover crops beyond some of this. So certainly um, uh, cleaner fruit and fruit not lying directly on the soil. Uh, if you look at this picture in the background, this was from um, some uh, pumpkin field, and actually some research from a few years ago where we had cereal rye out. And uh, you, you know, just looking, this is mid season, not quite into the season, but look at the residue back there and just imagine that pumpkin fruit laying on that versus it laying on uh, a clean tilled soil. So certainly that the fruit cleanliness is huge, especially on some of these uh, varieties that have different bumps and, and harder to clean surfaces. I don't like washing pumpkins. I would really prefer mother nature to do it. And I can think of in uh, my own personal experiences with no-till and cover crops, probably only one out of the last 16 years 
um, have I had to do any, you know, substantial washing, um, you know, especially of larger pumpkin fruit. Uh, and that was even kind of modest. I think that was uh, just more for some last minute aesthetics because we had to harvest during the rain and we're picking a little soil up on our gloves. So um, certainly that's a big deal. Easier field access um, and harvesting, uh, just it makes life so much easier, even if it's just you out there picking them, uh, not having to trudge through the rain. And, and I've harvested in the rain uh, and been able to, to manage it with, you know, some of those alternate uh, cover cropping systems in place. Weed suppression, I just gave you some good illustrations of how that can work. And our residues from these cover crops really help enhance our weed control, not necessarily a, uh, solve all of our long, our weed control issues season long, but they are certainly a great tool. And I think, you know, in some systems, you know, we can be working towards, you know, relying, you know, maybe even solely as we work with those to for weed control. Uh, nitrogen production, if you add some legumes, uh, is also important. And then we have all kinds of beneficial insects that can help to improve our soil health and good benefits. Now there are considerations. Um, so we do have to have a heavy cover crop residue for weed suppression. Uh, and we're relying on herbicide options. You know, our standard cultivation uh, practices aren't available. I think there are certainly lots of technologies for uh, high residue um, cultivators, things that like just undercut the soil to remove uh, weeds. And that's certainly an option. If you have equipment like that, there are options to utilize those. Um, planting and transplanting without appropriate equipment that can handle um, the no-till, certainly it can be a challenge in the cover crops. Uh, heavy residue at times can keep the soil wet, um, but it, whenever the weather is wet, especially at planting, this is most problematic. However, on dry times, you can also preserve your moisture. Um, so it's, uh, it, of course, then plays into the weather and you just have to think about, uh, remember a, a growing cover crop, even like cereal rye or something, which is common, is, is pulling water out of the soil. So anything we can do to keep that pulled out, we can reduce soil can, or the moisture in wet years, but also can over dry it if we're not careful. So you have to balance the weather and watch it. And so that does require some added management. So we have to look at things differently than we do a little bit with our conventional tillage programs. Voles and mice can also be uh, predators of seeds and sometimes even predators of pumpkins and cause some, some issues. So that can be a little more problematic, but uh, usually can be managed and kind of uh, avoided with some consideration. So there's lots of information on cover crops out there. Cereal rye, I would say followed up by wheat would be two of the most common cover crops we use as far as small grains and pumpkins and cereal rye, which seems to be certainly the most common. Um, they have very good at suppressing weeds and they have that residue to help support and, uh, and protect the fruit from being on the soil. Legumes are good, um, but don't provide as much weed suppression. Um, and I think really a small grain legume mix if I wanted to use the legumes, it would be where I would be at. And I think that that's a great, um, a great combination of the two of those. So I don't have time to go into it now, but um, the Midwest Cover Crop Council has tons of great cover crop selection resources. So refer to that. I'll provide the link um, and we have that available for you guys. So that's uh, another option uh, to, to do further research on cover crops beyond what we have time to talk today. So direct seeding, how are you going to do that? Certainly, I mentioned the aspect of by hand or a modified corn planter. So here you can see a couple of different grower options, you know, of, of basically, you know, corn planter type or other vegetable seed planters that are in this case in, modified for no-till, but certainly could be used in the tillage systems as well. We have uh, the one you see on the right is a monosim, so that's actually a vacuum driven. However, there are some um, some plate and finger pickup style planters that also can do can do fairly well. Um, so if you're using uh, like a finger pickup style setup, uh, you can see on the left here we have an image of a modified uh, kind of a homemade modified. Um, this would be like a John Deere or Kinsey style finger pickup planter. Uh, uh, what this is is this would be. Uh, one that we've removed some of the fingers to allow for a wider plant spacing, whereas otherwise it's hard to uh, basically get the unit to turn slow enough and not put down way too many seeds out in the field. 
Um, the other option some growers use is they will actually remove the seed box completely, uh, have a spot for someone to ride, and then they will just put a, like a tube and a funnel and they will just drop seeds. In this image, you can see, if you look in the back, you can see like a spray paint mark on a wheel. They'll, to help with spacing, they'll use uh, some kind of marking on a gauge or planter wheel to show you every, to kind of gauge how many feet it is between plants and you just know to drop a seed every so often um, based as whenever that mark comes up on the wheel. And so I've, I've known a lot of growers that have done this. It allows a lot of flexibility for seed sizes and seed singulation. And also you can switch varieties literally as fast as you can grab a different seed in your finger. So that's another uh, advantage to that system. And you got the mechanization and time savings of the planting operation of the planter. So transplanting is another option uh, with a mechanical transplanter. Um, when you do this, you usually have roughly a two week or so head start on the growing season compared to direct seeding. It is a more efficient use of seed, which for some varieties that seed can be as, you know, can be a, a certainly an, a, a significant expense as part of the operation. And you have really good control of plant spacing, as you can see here is a opportunity where we're, uh, we're uh, no-till transplanting and you can, um, uh, you can uh, see there the plant spacing below that we can get an achievement of that. Here's just some more um, pictures of transplanting. So you can see where we're taking a good idea of uh, about a two leaf pumpkin plant and then laying those right out in the soil uh, through our residue, giving a little drink at that time. And then uh, voila, we have kind of instant pumpkin field. Uh, and the nice thing with transplanting, if you're concerned about, say, mice and stuff, voles, you can avoid a lot of, say, seed predation issues by doing the transplants. Also, it's good because you can, again, just like the dropping the seeds by hand on a planter, you can switch varieties literally as fast as you can grab a different plant. Uh, plastic mulch is can be used, not quite as common. It depends on your area and just really what setup you have. My general take on plastic mulch is due to the large scale and like say larger, larger acreages it takes say to grow pumpkins. Um, sometimes it's maybe not, um, it may not be the most cost effective uh, to lay plastic for a pump, lay specific plastic for pumpkins. However, I have seen um, situations where pumpkins have been double cropped uh, down in our area after plastic culture strawberries. And I think that's very effective because you can get a second life out of plastic that otherwise wouldn't have a life and, you, uh, and would probably get torn out after that. And the timing works very well whenever strawberry harvest would end uh, in say mid-May versus when pumpkin planting would be you know, early, uh, late May, early June. Uh, one concept with black plastic that can be an issue a little bit is that pumpkins really don't need extra heat, especially in the southern part of Illinois. So trying, sometimes we can get plants a little too warm and they do tend to shut down fruit set when we get above 95 degrees. However, if later in the season when fruit set comes, if you have that plastic canopied by leaf cover, you don't have that same heating effect on the plastic. So that's not always a huge deal, but a consideration. So planting date. Um, so we're looking at somewhere anywhere from 85 to 120 days for maturities. Um, so you want to kind of gauge that as far as when you want to plant. Um, not There is some flexibility and the plants will on a warm summer and good growing conditions will make up for some of those days, so to speak. But there are some varieties, some specialty pumpkins and heirloom types that are closer to 120 days and you really do need to plant them earlier in the season in order to get them you know, to a full mature status compared to some of our um, maybe smaller size pumpkins or some of the jack-o'-lanterns that have been developed that have a shorter growing season uh, and requirements. So, uh, so do think about uh, when you want to start your market. If you need or a wholesale operation and you need to be doing some harvest in late August, that's different than if you're a retail operation that doesn't want to open, say, maybe even a month later until later in September. Uh, because ideally, you would like for your peak harvest to uh, and peak maturity to come kind of as you're just starting to open up. Uh, your and, and harvest, whether it be having people in or just do harvest, you know, it doesn't do you a lot of good to have tons of mature fruit ripe uh, August 1st and just sitting out in the field for a month and a half before you need them. You know, the, the fresher the fruit are and the less time they spend, say, in the field, the better quality you're going to have uh, from uh, removing those fruit and to 
for shelf life and things like that. So mid-May through June for direct seeding uh, and for transplanting, um, allowing two to three weeks to grow your transplants from seed. We can transplant even, uh, at least in Southern Illinois, I've done some from say mid-June through even the first part of July with using that little bit of a, a bump in time. So there are plant spacings. Uh, so this is pretty important for pumpkin. It is dependent on your equipment and variety. Uh, it tends to increase with pumpkin size, but can, I like to consider square feet per plant as a baseline to help me gauge this. So this could be you know, working with your row spacings and then within and between row at what your planter setups can and can't do. But say for gourds and small pumpkins, say 18 to 22 square feet per plant, things like pie pumpkins, pie size. So that could be say, maybe it's a six foot rows of plants every three feet. Um, and then you could have jack-o'-lantern pumpkins that could be anywhere from 24 to up to 40 or maybe more than 40 square feet per plant for some of the really large jumbo size. And so there, maybe it's your 24 could be like a, a four by six. So again, six foot rows, uh, with four feet, you know, a lot of people use five foot row spacings uh, for some things working off of a 30 inch uh, corn planter and using every other row. So you can adapt this and basically utilize your knowing your row spacing setups and utilize this square feet um, per plant concept to help uh, kind of guide what your within row spacing should target to be. And lots of seed companies will give you guidance, especially on certain varieties that may have needs to give you the same performance that you desire with your plant spacings. Uh, tends to be if you space pumpkins out, your general tendency will to get larger fruit, but if you crowd them too much and get too many plants, you can get plants that are a little bit, or a fruit that are a little bit smaller than what you would expect from that variety. It's still a lot variety dependent, but within varieties, it does vary with plant spacing somewhat. Uh, pollinators are very important, especially bumblebees and squash bees and honeybees to a certain extent. Um, the more bee visits we get, uh, the larger the fruit is. And so female pumpkin flowers open very early in the morning and they only open once. So, so you have one day to get that pollination. And on average, it takes 12 to 15 bee visits per female flower. Um, and so consider trying to promote pollinator habitat. Um, uh, squash bees are native bees that actually thrive with no-till practices because they are solitary and live in the soil. Um, so think about ways you can promote, um, promote your local pollinators. Some cases we do, uh, we do have beehives. Um, however, some research has shown just due to the nature of pumpkin flowers and their anatomy is that uh, honeybees tend to not be maybe as uh, efficient of pollinators as say some of our bumblebees and squash bees. Pumpkin flowers are very large. And so uh, oftentimes you're maybe not getting as much pollen moving uh, from flower to flower off of a honeybee than one visit of a bumblebee or a squash bee, which is a little larger and carries more pollen. Um, so that's just a, a thought. I, I've heard varying opinions on beehives, but some would say that you may not be gaining as much as you think with, uh, with having beehives. All depends on your native landscape and your native pollinators. Variety selection is really important. Um, you have you know, all kinds of different uh, options out there. I'm gonna hit on a few of these and some of the variety trialing we've done. These are just a couple examples of some really nice jack lantern varieties, Eagle City Gold, Early Prince, Renegade, Magic Wand. These are some, some kind of common standard ones we see from our companies, but there are dozens and dozens of varieties. Um, so some others, we get to specialties. There's things like, you know, uh, cotton candy is a standard white, Long Island cheese or also fairy tale or some tan ones, blue Jaredale, blue doll or some blue ones, red warty thing. And there's other uh, reds such as Cinderella. Uh, Autumn gold is, is a kind of moderate sized jack-o'-lantern to kind of a standard. One too many here is one of the, the red kind of uh, white with the uh, red veins on it uh, and tons of others. Remember with a lot of these, especially pumpkin, this would be a blue Jaredale on top and then a fairy tale on the bottom. Um, they also have a lot of edible purposes. So uh, you have, you can see the flesh quality in some of these is, is really, really high. So this, I don't know if anyone had uh, had a chance to take like a blue Jaredale and cut it open to see just how golden yellow and thick that flesh is in some of these. And your, a lot of your 
your processing type pumpkins, which would tend to be your, your tan color, have this really bright golden uh, orange color flesh in them. Just some things to consider, especially as you're marketing. And um, I have more and more people that do have an interest uh, in utilizing their pumpkins for, uh, for other culinary purposes. So some other things, some unique things, you have like white kushaws, which are really large, you know, white uh, kushaws, shaped uh, squash. We have warty goblin, a really good variety that has these distinctive green uh, green bumps or warts on the skin. Uh, moonshine is a really nice white variety. Um, peanut pumpkin has kind of a pinkish look with uh, this kind of almost like peanut shell uh, look callousing on the surface. And then we go down to the smaller ones, things like autumn wings, which is a really nice uh, winged, a uh, multicolored gourd, daisy gourds, which are kind of uh, kind of star or flower shaped, multicolored, and then our traditional mini pumpkins, things like munchkin, uh, Jack B. Little types, and then Casparita or baby boo, which are mini white pumpkins. So that's just a little bit on variety selection. Uh, we also, I'll mention later, we have some variety trial uh, work that we have ongoing uh, and for through some pumpkin field days. And so there's lots of great variety trial resources out there uh, through the vegetable variety trial reports through the Midwest vegetable variety trials. And also we have through the local foods YouTube where these webinars are recorded. If you look, there's a pumpkin playlist there and I have other information with some video walkthroughs of variety trials and things. So check out the YouTube and also those variety trial reports to get the full report on literally dozens and dozens of pumpkin varieties we've tested over the last few years. So pest management is crucial. So we, uh, I always defer to specifically our Midwest Vegetable Production Guide, uh, which we'll talk about and I have uh, listed later in the resources, lots of great pest management, insect weed disease information, and then also, this is another good resource we have uh, from Illinois that just has some good pictures. If you want to order, it's called uh, um, Identifying and Managing Cucurbit Pest. Uh, good for those references on trying to get that, uh, identify what pest or problem you have. So I would say, uh, you know, some weed management concepts. So pumpkin plant competition can, can severely reduce yields and it's more limiting than some of our other diseases if they're not or excuse me other pests if they're not controlled. So weeds limit air movement so that can increase the incidence of some of our diseases. They can interfere with our spray coverage when we're making pesticide applications to protect our plants and we really don't want to spray the weeds and protect them right. We want it to get those products to work when we're making those you know fairly costly applications. We want them to get on the the pumpkin plant. So those weeds have multiple um, kind of downsides to consider. And they do also harbor other insects and diseases. So this is an example from a herbicide trial we had done and just what a non-treated, we did nothing to this area to control weeds. It was basically burned down clean at planting, but nothing, no residual herbicides or anything to no other means to control it. And this is what we look, uh, we look like. You can see there are some pumpkin plants in there, but they're a lot of competition and you don't pull a lot of fruit out of something like that. So common weeds we see um, are amaranthus, which would be water hemp, pigweeds, palmer amaranth. Those are by and far the most common. Anytime I go places, that's usually the number one weed for in our region where people you know, list as issues. Morning glories are very problematic and we don't have a lot of good options for management of those. Um, hop horn bean copper leaf, which is the one pictured here, is uh, a later season summer annual weed, a little more prevalent maybe in the southern part of the state. Our ragweeds, uh, common lamb's quarter, velvet leaf, purslane, cocklebur, crabgrass, and some of our other uh, grass species. And a lot of these things really does depend on your geography and what weeds you have on your farm and in your region. How do we manage them? I would say uh, overall herbicides are used fairly commonly in our management. So uh, pre-emergent herbicides, we have a lot of options, uh, relatively speaking, so some things we can do to help suppress those weeds early, which early in the season is certainly for competition purposes where we really need that weed control. Post-emergence, we have very limited options for broadleaves. If you have a pumpkin field, and you have broadleaf weeds that have emerged in it and you wanna be reactive you know, after the fact to do something and the pumpkins are up, you really have very limited options of something you can spray broadly across the field. 
you do have some option with post-directed sprays, but these are things that would normally kill the pumpkin fruit, but with our wide spacing, if you have a shielded sprayer, you can go down between crop rows and make applications. So from there, uh, cover crops and no-till, we talked about that a little bit, certainly lots of advantages there. You can gain weed control, uh, tillage and cultivation, hand weeding and hoeing. And the biggest thing, you know, start clean of that field, no matter what kind of tillage system you're in, and then prevent those weeds from going to seed so you don't build up those fields with a prevalence of one certain weed that's always gone to seed and causes you perpetual issues year after year. So from that other picture, which I showed you as a non-treated, this is an option where you have, you can see we have a, uh, a crop uh, where we've used a common herbicide, uh, dual magnum plus reflex, which are some labeled options we have available to us in Illinois. And so that's the kind of weed control you can see compared with that earlier slide that non-treated with this type of program. So it certainly brings a lot of value. And this is where we did a follow up with a grass herbicide as well to, to remove some grasses. Insect management. Most of our insect pests we have are things like cucumber beetles and squash bugs, um, which are uh, you can see down in the, the lower left and middle pictures. Um, those are most prevalent. Um, squash vine borer can be an issue, especially smaller scale, but tends to not be as problematic as it is in some other crops. Um, in this past year, we also had some issues with melon worms, which is that uh, picture with the pumpkin fruit. It's a small green worm with two stripes. It was very sporadic in nature, but has been reported in this kind of scattered around the state, certainly in the southern part, I've heard of multiple growers with that issue. We're not sure if this is going to be a recurring pest or just something that maybe have uh, have blown into the area for this season, but something that we're certainly watching. So insects can defoliate plants, they can scar up fruits or even kill entire plants. So that's why we are concerned and they can sometimes get out of hand to the point that we can't recover some of our, our injury, especially scarring of fruits since we are selling all these fruits based off of their beauty. Uh, and so uh, that can be very important. Insecticides are our most common options and we do have conventional or synthetic, or excuse me, conventional or organic OMRI approved products that can be utilized there is another uh, organic approach in some scales, there is uh, exclusion netting is used. However, often the scale and size to which we're growing pumpkins on, exclusion netting isn't as effective as it is on some of our smaller scale crops. Uh, if you are spraying any kind of insecticide, you know, spray late into the evening to, or even after dark to save the bees. Bees aren't active and those flowers are closed versus early in the morning, which is the worst time. You cannot get up earlier, I'm convinced, than, uh, than our bees and pollinators and our pumpkin flowers, which open up very, very early in the morning. Um, crop rotation is very important for these pests, so that I would, you know, another reason, keep those crops rotated and don't go year after year in the same area. So disease management is also very important. Things like powdery mildew is a standard disease, which uh, you can see in that lower left picture. You can see those small white lesions. Downy mildew is a sporadic disease that comes in, uh, has to blow up from other areas. Uh, and then bacterial spot is a, a common issue, especially in very, very wet growing seasons and wet areas. Those are some of our most common. Phytophthora is another one that comes up some, especially in very wet areas, but these top, especially powdery mildew by and far is the most common disease that if you've grown pumpkins, especially more than once, you've, uh, you usually will have issues with that. Crop rotation is important. For powdery mildew, we do have some resistant varieties um, and they will resist powdery mildew, but they still can get powdery mildew, but they will be the later varieties to get it and often can still maintain yield better uh, with the presence of some powdery mildew. Uh, one thing to note with powdery mildew, its biggest deterrent is it can get, uh, it can defoliate fruit or excuse me, plants, but it also can get on the pumpkin stems. And if you've ever seen a pumpkin that the stem after you harvest it, it just kind of shrivels up into this little tiny, about to maybe a fraction of the size. Often that's because it's had a powdery mildew infection and that basically uh, reduces some of the, basically the dry matter of that stem. And so when it dries out, there's just, there's just nothing left to it. Fungicides are, are one of our most common approaches and they are usually all protectants and, and prevent infection, whereas not as compared with being reactive. 
any of these products, and this includes insecticides, um, you know, apply at at least 30 to 50 gallons per acre for effective coverage. You really have to have higher GPA, especially for ground applications. Uh, once you see a widespread outbreak, it's often too late. So you really do have to be scouting, you know, for powdery mildew. As soon as we see it on a lower leaf, that's where we want to start our spray program. Other pests, things like mice and voles, uh, as you can see mice and vole damage on extreme in that pumpkin picture there, that's I've only found occasionally, but certainly is frustrating when it happens. Um, occasionally, it tends to be more problem, more sporadic and will be, uh, can be dealt with, uh, they'll feed on fruit as well as some of the direct seeded. Uh, it can be a little more problematic with cover crops. Um, how to manage this, uh, the biggest thing that I've found can be um, if you see scouting and watching for vole runs in the soil and then using some strategic bait stations, you're not baiting the whole field, but if you see a hot spot, you know, setting up an area where you have a bait protected that only they can get to it. Uh, and that, that's certainly a way to help you know, reduce population. I think you can tolerate a low level of, of, uh, of feeding and, and presence, but certainly they can get to the point in that they are very problematic. Deer can also be a problem, uh, and, and if they develop a taste for pumpkins. I had pumpkins for probably 10 or 14 years before I had a deer even touch them, and now they'll graze on them once in a while, but it tends to be, we just kind of coexist. They get a couple of them, and then uh, then the rest are, rest are for us, and you know, that's, that's all right. Usually, uh, unless you have heavy populations or just nothing else for them to eat, they aren't so bad um, that they, cause complete devastation, but certainly annoying nevertheless. So harvest, you're going to harvest your fruit when they're at their full mature color. Your jack-o'-lanterns may have just a teensy bit of green um, and they will ripen up, but you really want them to maximize uh, that harvest. You, that harvest is almost virtually all by hand for our ornamental markets. Uh, pumpkins, you do need, to, I say, need to cut the stems of the pruning shears. It gives you a nice clean look. Some people will kind of tear them off, but for some that doesn't, uh, doesn't work quite as well, especially for larger, uh, larger fruits. Some of the smaller gourds and things you can snap. Um, the handles or stems are very important. So trying to maintain a long stem and handle is extremely important to the marketability. Very few people want a pumpkin that doesn't have a stem. Um, so, and then how are you gonna transport fruit? So there's multiple ways. I have really utilized these uh, pallet sized bins here a lot. Um, I love them. These are a food grade plastic bin, which is a little overkill, but they fold up and they are super handy. They fold up to be about a foot tall. Um, they, the pallet, palletization of things is, is very, very handy for pumpkins. You see that a lot. Um, so at some points, whenever you're growing pumpkins, you'll start, if you don't have a good plan for this, you'll start putting pumpkins in literally anything you can find at times, uh, which is fine. And just think about logistics of how you're gonna handle them. When we first started our pumpkin operation, we did a lot of pumpkin handling. And as I've moved away to bins, and things like that, I've eliminated a lot of individual handling of fruit that saves tons of time, especially if you don't have excessive labor. Obviously our cardboard, um, our cardboard uh, pallets and, and crates that we see in the stores are very common. So how are you gonna market things? Um, direct marketing, uh, a lot of it through farmer's markets um, and on-farm agritourism and custom displays. Uh, wholesale, you go to local stores, farm markets that need to supplement. Uh, maybe they have an orchard, but they want to buy pumpkins or just need a few extra pumpkins. Also produce auctions. But no matter what, you know, try to make a good display and encourage a good display. If it's someone you're wholesaling to or whatever, displays are, are kind of very important to draw, really draw people in, show them the, the diversity of fruit you have. Retail sales uh, pricing, uh, a lot of per pound or per each. I've seen both. Um, so my thoughts on per pound, it's easy to adjust for pumpkin size. You don't have to, you know, you know the size is kind of self-explanatory, but I found that customers, they can have a hard time estimating the price. So they can be sometimes sticker shock as far as how much a pumpkin actually will cost. Just to say, oh, it's uh, 49 cents a pound or 39 cents a pound. It seems innocent until, it, uh, until you, uh, step up to the cash register. Um, per each is very straightforward for customers, but depending on your market setup, you know, if it's a you pick, it can be harder to, uh, to set that out and take some different organizations. So one thing that I have seen 
uh, if you sell by the pound is uh, near, uh, say, a checkout area, have a display with, say, three to six fruit of graduated sizes that are clearly priced. And that way a consumer can say, oh, this is a this is about how much a pumpkin this size would be. Because it gives them a frame of mind. You and I, if you've grown pumpkins, may know how much a pumpkin weighs by picking it up. But a lot of people just, they don't have any clue. And when they walk up and realize that this pumpkin is, you know, a, a $15 pumpkin, they sometimes, you know, it just changes their kind of attitude slightly. So wholesale is another option that some people don't use, but I think if you, even if you have a farm market, you may be missing part of the population. And although you don't get the same amount of money, remember it's a quick and easy, you don't have to spend four hours you know, sitting at a farmer's market. Um, you don't have to do the customer relations part. You can just grow pumpkins and you can work with a local store or market and give them what they need and still do that. So also think about, depending on the environment, brand your products with your farm name and location. Always sell a quality product. I think growing quality can be your best tool for making repeat sales. That's why I stress some of our pest management. You can grow pumpkins and maybe not manage some of these diseases, but if I had a dollar for every time someone early in the season asked, how long, asked me how long this pumpkin will keep, and I tell them it'll keep till Christmas. They sometimes look at me funny, but then the next year when they come back and tell me that they still have that pumpkin, even in January or February, they realize that buying quality fruit uh, can have a lot of difference. So keeping your fruit clean is also another part of that. You're all about the appearance and don't forget about those handles and stems. So a quick overview of what a season would look like. This is an example where you would no-till transplant after wheat harvest. So we're basically uh, starting our transplants in June. We harvest wheat and then burn down and then mow down the stubble. And then late June, early July, we're putting those transplants out and then scouting for our disease and pest uh, pressure, making maybe a herbicide application mid-season for uh, grasses. Then we're, we're starting a fungicide and insecticide program as we see needed. And, and of course, scouting and using those products, you know, you know, I try to say sparingly, but as needed to maintain a healthy crop. And then uh, we're trying to continue and scout and uh, make sprays as needed. And then we're going to start harvest and like say our main harvest in that mid-September to mid-October, uh, especially for direct market uh, use. So here are a few resources. I think some of these we've shared throughout the time. So, uh, but certainly you can search any of these names, you know, all the variety trial reports, those two uh, production guides, and then our El the Illinois Local Foods YouTube channel. Um, great resources beside the webinars, certainly some of those field day and, and specific pumpkin resources there. So please look those up. So I think pumpkins and gourds can be a great addition to a small farm enterprise. They're relatively easy to grow, um, and, but there's some things to be managed with any crop. Um, there's some good marketing opportunities, as we said, and consider your opportunities and whether it be a farm market or retail or wholesale. Uh, there are certainly lots of work, but very fun. So I has, as we wrap up here, I have uh, a couple of things I wanna share, and that's we're gonna have our 2022 uh, pumpkin field day on uh, Thursday, September 1st, uh, it is going to be at Eckert's Orchard. We're going to have research trials out there. Uh, so watch your, uh, put that date in your mind and certainly uh, watch our, uh, our Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter uh, for more information on that. And in case you don't get the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter, I would highly recommend that. So we have lots of great pumpkin information in there and share links to think programs like this very program uh, you're uh, listening to here today. Uh, I think it's uh, a great resource, uh, though I'm myself and a couple of my colleagues might be a little biased because we're contributors to it. Uh, it. You can sign up for email alerts to this uh, monthly newsletter by sending an email to myself at my email there, which you'll see also at the end, or Bronwyn Ailey, my co-editor in this little adventure. So the, the last ad I have is that as through extension, we are right now doing a, a needs assessment survey across the state. We want all of our farmers, especially, especially crop growers, to give us input so we can help guide the programming extension provides. So this is, encompasses row crops, some livestock, and also especially crop production. So if you would, there is a QR code there. You can also just go to uh, go.illinois.edu slash agneeds. 
uh, and please give us some input. Uh, it is, uh, this is really valuable to help, you know, our goal is to help uh, and we can know from talking with people individually, you know, some needs, but certainly we want to hear from you if you want to help kind of guide and give us feedback as where you would like to see programming, whether it be pumpkins or other crops. So, so with that, I, uh, I thank you all for, uh, for your time today and, uh, and certainly uh, feel free to contact me if you have any, uh, any further questions or questions or information that you would like to, uh, uh, would like to find out more about. So if you wanna get the newsletter, my email is down there uh, as, as well, so. All right. Well, thank you, Nathan. We've still got some time for questions, so we're going to kind of work our way back from where we were at earlier. Um, one thing I will mention is that the references that were made by Nathan today can be accessed in the a box folder that was created with the handout. We just quickly made a document, and it's now in the chat box as well. But if you look at your emails that have been sent from us the last couple of this morning for the handout, the references are also now in that box link too. We've also just launched our demographic poll and yet again, it's voluntary, it's completely anonymous. We just use it for our programming. So to uh, kind of think about some of our questions that have happened so far today, one of the questions that someone had is that they, they grow three different kinds of pumpkins. They grow baby bear, they grow Jack B. Little, and they grow an mm -hmm. early sweet sugar pie. Uh -huh. In your experience, is there maybe another pumpkin out there that might be a good one to add to that? They do direct market, um, and they also uh -huh. love assistance with think anything that's more focused on smaller pumpkins too, if you will. Uh, well, is there one? I, I will say there are tons of options. So, um, and I didn't hit on this. I did a little bit with some of the in the variety section, but uh, I would uh, I would encourage you to look at some of those variety trial um, uh, information, those reports, because in there uh, we have not only some some yield data and information, but there's also color pictures of you know some of these have anywhere uh, I know the 2020 one has like 54 pumpkin varieties of different shapes and sizes, and I think the the one prior had maybe close to 80 or something like that. Um, so there, it, it all depends on, on what you want. So personally, I will just say, um, at least in brief, you know, the, the diversity of color, whether it be whites or some of the warties or tans or, or shades of blue, um, reds, I mean, those are just probably the, the, the hottest thing that I've seen retail wise, you know, people love the diversity. Um, it's way more than just the basic orange orange pumpkins as far as what's out there and what people go for. Uh, the the more unique, almost the 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 better. I uh, certainly we sell lots of orange jack o' lanterns, but certainly if I had one thing to say would be just and I do this for myself is that pick something you that you personally like because then you're more invested in growing you something you think looks cool and uh and and try it and i would be willing to bet if you see if you see it marketed in our you know seed local seed sources i bet you there would be consumers that like it too great uh this is a question that kind of combines two other questions so it's it's about your pollination there was a uh -huh. question first off is it possible to you know, do anything such as like hand pollination or manual pollination. And then another person asked, is there a, um, if we remove flowers from our pumpkin plant, can that result in bigger pumpkins? All right, so the first part, uh, so hand pollination, yes, you can hand pollinate. Um, I think I would maybe gear this more towards if you were doing like, uh, um, trying to do this say for um, uh, uh, the purposes of say trying to grow a large pumpkin or something like a very specific the thought of hand pollinating a couple acres of pumpkins is is I don't unless you have just a lot of nothing better to do I think is maybe not a not a real good use of time um, but yes you can take so the the male flowers or of course the flowers that don't have that small you know the fruit on them there are way more male flowers you will find on pumpkin plants than what there are uh, female flowers. The female flowers have that small, basically, um, 
immature fruit on it behind the base of the flower. Um, you can take uh, male flowers and take and strip the petals off and have the, uh, you know, the, the pollen there and you can take and basically, you know, rub that around inside the, uh, you know, inside the, uh, uh, the, uh, the female flower and, uh, and, and basically do the same thing as what bees would do. Uh, we actually did for like pumpkin breeding, that's actually what we would do is we'll isolate that. But, so you can do that um, if you desire. So, um, so yeah. Did I cover that or is there what else? Well, and then if you, if you remove flowers, will that help with those that are already pollinated? So, so there Maybe is, bigger, I guess. so where, where you can do that is I have heard of people on, again, the larger size pumpkins where you, um, where you want to get a really large fruit, say only keeping one fruit per plant. So basically removing um, female flowers, um, you know, add to you to where any and young fruit, so you only have one fruit where that effort is going into would be uh, would be beneficial. But really, again, that is that would be a technique for say trying to maximize the size of a pumpkin. If you're just trying to grow larger pumpkins, you need to look into your variety selection because there's pumpkins that by variety will grow anywhere from one pound up to thirty or forty pounds, and so you, it's hard to make a a, what should be a 10 pound pumpkin into a 40 or 50 pound pumpkin a lot that's all goes back to variety selection where you're really trying to uh trying to get that increased size so but for for those trying to take uh grow large pumpkins you know for say contest size then yeah you can do some of that manipulation okay um this is a, a two-part question on crop rotation um so how far does the crop rotation need to be and what if you can't crop rotate so as far, I would say is the distance wise between rotation, um, as far as you can, um, uh, these, you know, any rotation, if you're just in a different, not in physically the same spot, that's great. If you can't rotate, um, I think, you know, the addition of some of your cover crops can help to break things up a little bit, but some of our annual summer annual pests and stuff are, you know, they, you know, they overwinter on residues and things and, uh, and they're just innately going to, you know, be in that same area. So, uh, so certainly, um, certainly that is a, uh, um, that's a challenge. So the biggest thing you can do it, but just know in the back of your mind, and I've seen growers that, you know, have a, could detest to this, that, you know, over the course of time, especially above five years, you know, in the same spot, just know that some of these pests and disease pressure can just get, can get really high. Um, I would also make sure you're on top of your managing your weeds, because I've also seen you can build up a specific population of a weed that, you know, just uh, tends to go to seed. It, it's your problem weed, and it goes to seed one year, and it keeps going. And it's your it's kind of your 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 kryptonite in pumpkins. It competes well. It does, and it it just kind of expands from there. So make sure. Um, so just be very vigilant on pest management all throughout. That's my that's my take home. If you can't rotate. Okay. Um, we had a had a question earlier about roller crimper. Any advice for using that piece of machine? Like anything that we need to especially be aware of as we think about it. So, um, so I've used a roller crimper some, and this could be a whole nother talk. So, but in short, I will say is if you're using that, um, it has a couple of two thoughts. If you're laying down cover crop residue flat, you, you help to minimize some of your bowl and pest issues versus if it's kind of partially standing. If it's partially standing, it gives more cover than what it does when it's laid down. The other thought is if you're using a roller crimper solely for termination of say cereal rye, you have to wait until flowering, until that rye is actually flowering and shedding pollen or slightly after that in order for it to be effective at termination. Prior to that, it'll want to re-sprout and regrow. It has to do with the physiology of the plant and when it's switching to more of a reproductive role versus vegetative and growth. So that's the biggest thing is timing for, for roller crimping. Okay. Uh, well, we're at one o'clock, so um, we're going to conclude our questions here. If you have any remaining questions for Nathan, please feel free to, to email him. I know we had a couple of more still in the chat box, but we have to be um, respectful of, of our time today. So thank you again, Nathan, for uh, presenting today. Um, as you all have been given the link, the go to Illinois.edu uh, slash 
S S F W W 2022 YouTube, which we'll put in the chat box. We'll have to have the recording today uploaded tomorrow. Uh, please join us next week for an overview of the Illinois home to market law and have a good rest of your week.